I'm do me. I'm I'm this fabulous in the bush with my high heel, with my bling. Um, I'm a very independent girl um, who hooked up with a guy online, and um, they both decided to just you know go out into the bush and just explore Africa because he's an American, and his name is Denzel. We go on the night drive. A lot of shady things start happening. We don't quite understand what's going on. Uh, it's gory. I must tell you. It's, ew. Gosh, it's, you don't even have to act. You see it and you like, it's, it's amazing. Denzel's this sort of regular guy, you know, he could almost be any any one of us. He's not as happy as he used to be and, and starts this sort of relationship online with this gorgeous woman through me who's in South Africa. And, and I think that it quickly goes a lot farther um, than he expected to. And he thinks it's going to be a sort of revitalizing moment for himself and that it'll be a great adventure, you know, and it ends up being a great nightmare. What the hell was that? Roger Turner, he's a, a retired publisher. He's got a company still ticking over, but now's the time to take a break. And most of his life, he's read about Africa. And finally, he made the decision, the decision to persuade his wife, Mary, to come to Africa on a safari and fulfill what is a, a lifetime dream for him. And off they go to uh, darkest Africa. I can't believe we're actually here. Africa. It's uh, a fabulous experience for him when they first arrive and they, they do the usual things that uh, people do, the Land Rover going around, seeing the game. Then the fun begins. Things start to turn, turn just a little dark for Roger and Mary. This is the 50th wedding anniversary of Mary and Roger. All his life, he's wanted to go to Africa. She hasn't been that keen on the idea, but she's never really let him know that because they, they really do love each other very much. So finally, after all these years, they've managed to get away. She's this sort of fairly upper-class English lady who's always had plenty of... Uh, her family had lots of money. And so they end up on this night drive to celebrate their 50th wedding anniversary. God, let them, man! Well, can you fix it? I'm not the mechanic. Hey, I didn't ask if you're a mechanic, chief. I asked, can you fix it? I can't... You know, I'm most trusted by his master and the family and adopted into the family as part of the family. I was very receptive to learning and that's how he endeared himself to the boss to a, to a point where uh, he was indispensable to his boss. He was a super tracker, having learned from his boss and uh, he was loved by all. Well, Augustino is um, absolutely not the innocent guy. <laughs> Augustino is, um, he's sort of like one of the mature guys that's grown up in, in this raw world of the bush, you know, and he's had to start off as a kid and work his ranks up in becoming the villain that he is in this film. So a very nice character and not easily figured out, but he really is quite experienced in the business that he's in. when we get to really see how um, cruel these guys can be, how dangerous they can be. It's my first night of a lot of long nights. Everyone's been scaring me how cold it gets at about midnight. So I got a little bit of a brown stain in my pants due to the fear of the cold. But you know, nothing I can't handle. <laughs> I think it's important to say that Trevor Calverley is just, I mean, he's a phenomenal cinematographer. Uh, he pays extreme attention to detail. Um, and first and foremost, his consideration is always the story. But when he first approached me with the idea of shooting on a high-end stills camera, uh, I was a bit skeptical. But then he showed me some footage of uh, music videos that he had shot, and I was sold on the spot. 
Night Drive was a first in that it was shot on Canon 5D Mark II cameras. Um, as far as we could tell when we shot, it was the first time those cameras had been used on a feature film um, ever. Um, it was a stylistic choice. Trevor, our DP, suggested it. And for the film that we were making, it was the right camera to choose. I think the images speak for themselves. Amazing thing specifically with the cinematography department, we, we had been testing cameras for specifically low light capability because we knew we had to shoot so much light in the middle of the bush. You don't want to be dragging a whole lot of lights and generators into the bush. Uh, so we ended up seeing a test on, on the Canon 5D Mark II, which was incredible, was incredible what this little camera can do. The other thing is really, really small, so you can get it into places you can't get anything else into. The style of, of the way South African cinema has been shot it's, it's kind of moving away from that traditional sense, you know, more cutting edge, very gritty feel to it. And um, I was pleasantly surprised. Those things, you know, I want to have one of those for myself because they're pretty amazing. We did run into a very interesting problem though. Because the camera is so small, it weighs almost nothing. Therefore, the slightest shake, the slightest breath from your operator shows up as a shake on screen. So suddenly we had this problem, so we had to start getting creative. Our grips department, they came up with this piece of equipment, which they lovingly named the Stingray, which is a handheld rig which they had to design and build for this camera. It, it did not exist before we shot this movie. In terms of building handheld rigs for the camera, um, body mounts, I think the end result was to further amplify the story in creating this jarring and frenetic energy that was needed, particularly in the chase sequences. Initial things that Justin did speak to me about and was kind of quite specific about was trying to um, encapsulate visually Sean's post-traumatic stress disorder that he, that he was suffering from in the movie and to try and capture that visually. And then Trev also suggested that we use a swing and tilt lens. And what they did for us is in certain scenes it blurs in and out certain sections of the image. And I think that was very important because it shows Sean as a character trying to maintain his grip on reality. We did, we did quite a few tests with that regard. Um, in, you know, in terms of adjusting his perception of time during, during those moments, adjusting his, his perception of his relationship between himself and the world and what was actually happening. One of the rooms that posed uh, quite a challenge was the camp manager's office. It was bizarre. So it's this long room, very narrow, and then this low um, slanted ceiling. So it was just a very strange space to work in. But then we had to try and work with it and completely recreate it to make it look like an office. It clearly was not an office space. So we found ourselves having to like put some big looking walls in or trying to make a slanted wall straight and um, then we had to hang giant animal heads and have skins on the floors and you know paint the room and obviously we you know with, with every space we had to leave it after we'd finished with it as it was originally. The, the Chang's apartment scenes uh, it, it actually plays out as one big sequence and um, it was uh, the, the production designer that did really well with um, kind of capturing what the set should look like, this dark, misty, it was actually quite disgusting to be on set, but you've, everyone felt it while we were there. So there's a lot of, um, a lot of small, prop, like drinks and things that you have to think about that they're drinking and guns, and then you get um, 
the the um, stunt people in and there's squibs shooting blood and all of this has to be coordinated and then we've got the blood on the walls later and blood on the wardrobe for wardrobe people and we had knives that are retractable and stabbing and this is one huge sequence and it it ends where where um, Chris chases Kenneth uh, through a corridor and it's this big stunt where he jumps over and respect to Kenneth because it was just he decided to do that on the day I'm just gonna jump over this trolley it looked amazing well, there was definitely a lot of planning that went went into the pre-prod of this film. Um, seeing as the story pretty much takes place over one evening, and uh, the story involves a lot of blood and gore. So on set was, was a lot of fun. We had uh, Face to Face as one of our sponsors, where they bought on all the special effects makeup. And we also had a few of the girls assisting us in the film. We were designing everything from bullet wounds, to scars, to scratches, to burns, to... Gosh, you can name it all. At a point, Corrine was running around, drenched in sweat and blood. And I think the one night, it was below zero, definitely. And she was just so cool about it and she just kept pushing through while we were there in like seven jackets trying to make it through the night and I think that was just really amazing. We had Robert Whitehead who just lay there as I like latex over his eyes and I mean they were just everyone was just so cool about it and yeah they were great. Bring it on! I think this is a first for South Africa. It's it's really a unique film. Um, it's exciting, it's intriguing, it's edge of your seat, action-packed. I think, yeah, I think audiences are gonna love it uh, because it's so different, you know, and because we, we kind of touching certain subjects. It's an honest, straightforward story, and I think it's it's one worth, worth telling. Lots of blood, lots of killing, lots of fun. It's all happening. There's elements of action, there's elements of a thriller, there's elements of suspense, um, and there's also drama. And within that, we've got very complex characters and one hell of a storyline. You know, we're, we're telling a real South African story in a very gory way. Night Drive will give you a lesson on how to survive that you will never forget. <laughs>